Chapter 9, the prayer of Daniel. We're talking about uh, prayer and uh, how come God answers our prayer sometimes? Sometimes it seems like they kind of uh, hit the ceiling. I was reading uh, a little book uh, uh, this week just uh, that Kathy was looking at as she was preparing for the messages that she'll be teaching and when we get to uh, Japan near the end of the trip. And one of them is uh, How Prayer Works by Jill Briscoe. She was talking about being a little girl growing up in London when there was uh, the bombing of uh, the Nazis in World War II. And, uh, and just uh, hearing the sirens go off and, and just praying, you know, running to the, air, uh, the shelters and so forth, that God would stop the bombing. And she was just saying how it terrified her and as, a, as a little girl and the bombing didn't stop. And, uh, and, and she kind of, you know, struggled with the whole issue of how prayer works. Uh, and um, I think here in Daniel, we... Uh, we get some great guidelines for prayer. It's not the, the end all of everything the Bible says about prayer, certainly, but I think there's some, some good things that, that we, could, uh, we need to understand uh, about prayer and, um, and what kinds of prayers are, are important to God and, and so forth and the motivation for, for praying. Uh, the other thing that occurred to me uh, was uh, yesterday as we were, I was kind of setting up for the, the ladies. Uh, they had their you know, luncheon and teaching here uh, via DVD and and I uh, don't usually, uh, not exactly my expertise, but I do know how to turn on the sound system and play a DVD, or so I thought, and I just couldn't get it to come on. You know, of course, the ladies are busy. They don't realize what's going on, and I'm kind of running, franicking around. It worked the last time, you know, and, uh, you know, trying this and trying that and changing the batteries and the remote and, you know, checking wires and everything I could do. And it's like, I'd pretty much done everything I could, I could think about doing. Still wasn't working, and I was standing back there, and I just thought, Man, I better start praying here. You know, I just started praying that God, God would cause this thing to happen somehow. And uh, I just kind of prayed a little quick, quick prayer, but very and very much earnest and, uh, and everything. And I looked down, there was one little cable there. I was like, Wait, that cable, that cable goes right there. Hey, that cable's getting, you know, and I kind of just jiggled it a little bit. It's the, I realized it was the one that uh, went to the DVD player and, and on it came. And it occurred to me that uh, sometimes that is the way we pray. When, last resort. Try everything else. If it doesn't work, pray, you know. And that's not exactly what God <laughs> intended for our prayer life to be like. It's supposed to be like first thing, priority, first thing that comes to our mind. And sometimes it's just like, man, if I can't figure out how to do this, if I have to, then, then I'll pray. But uh, I think we can see some great guidelines. So we're in Daniel chapter uh, 9. And we'll look at the first 23 verses, and then the next time we're in Daniel, we'll take the rest of the chapter, which is a, a very uh, a wonderful, uh, very incredibly important, but also number-wise a little bit complex in terms of the prophecy of, of Daniel 9, where he exactly spells out to the day when the Messiah, Jesus, would walk into Jerusalem and pro proclaim himself to be Messiah. Uh, which, of course, Jesus does on the very day Daniel said he would. So we'll look at that next time. Uh, verse 1 says, Daniel's heart, uh, or my first point is Daniel's heart was turned towards prayer because he was reading the word. That's what we see in the first three verses. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer, in the petition, in fasting, and in sackcloth, in ashes. So Daniel's reading the word. That's what prompted him to, uh, to pray. He's reading specifically the prophecy of, uh, of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, in, in, uh, in more than one place, mentions this whole idea of the Babylonian captivity. And, and again, Jeremiah's time is when uh, the people are still in the land, sacrifices are still going on, the temple's there, but there's idols everywhere. They've turned against God. They don't keep the Sabbath. They don't do any of the things that God had asked them to do. And uh, not only uh, 
uh, Jeremiah, but other prophets are warning them, if we don't turn back to God, God's going to judge us and, uh, and so forth. And it's during this time that uh, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 25, 11, this whole country will become a, a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord. And will make it desolate forever. I will bring upon that land all the things I have spoken against it, all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. So uh, again, Daniel is prompted to pray because he's reading the Bible, because he's reading the Word. And as he's doing that, uh, he gets kind of concerned. He gets kind of excited at the same time. Again, he's about 85, 86 years old. I mean, he's lived most of his life from the time he was like 15, 16 years old. He's lived in Babylon. He's served under two empires. He served under Nebuchadnezzar and the, and the Babylonian Empire. This is right at the time uh, of that empire. He knows that there's going to be a Medo-Persian empire that will be raised up after that. And we know that he served... Uh, uh, that particular government as well. But uh, he's concerned because he realizes that that 70 years is just about up. And so he begins to pray. Because he was reading, God prompted him to pray. And that's the way it should work. Uh, sometimes we're prompted to pray by circumstances, you know, like, how do I get this thing to work? God help me here, you know, or something's gone wrong or whatever. And, and that's fine. Somebody's sick, somebody else, that's fine. But there should be a place uh, in our lives where we're prompted to pray because we're reading the Bible. We're reading the Word. Here's God's Word. Here's what it says. Here's what it's saying to me. How should I respond? You know, well, it's, it's saying that this is how I should live my life. Well, Lord, I <laughs> don't exactly have that kind of love you're talking about there. Lord, I, but I see that you want it. Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with that love. And, uh, man, I kind of fall short in some of these other areas and. I read this thing about wisdom, and, uh, and I, I sure need more of that as well. God's speaking to me. I'm just talking back to him. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody where we walk up and you're, you're talking to them about a certain subject, and then they just change the subject on you? <laughs> it's like, man, did you see that game last week? Yeah, but I was at the air show. And let me tell you what, you know, and then you, you, you try to talk to them again about something, and then it's just another subject. That's what we do with the Lord a lot of times. He's trying to speak to our hearts. And then and we just want to switch the issue. Yeah, that's good, Lord, what you said here. But my deal, my thing is really a lot more important to me. So can we just kind of put what you're saying on hold here? Because I, I got some issues here I want, I want you to deal with, which is fine. You know, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. But sometimes, and I think it should be a priority that, hey, just reading the word, like Daniel it should move our hearts to prayer because of what we've read. Now, secondly, Daniel read and he believed God's word. Uh, that's very important as well. Uh, and again, let me read to you just a passage from Jeremiah 29.10. And, and uh, some of these verses are going to be real familiar to you. And maybe you've never seen them in context. But Jeremiah 29.10. 20, uh, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and, you will, uh, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations in places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, now we love the, the Jeremiah uh, 29, you know, 11. I know the plans I have for you and so forth. But again, get in, get in Daniel's shoes uh, as a 15, 16-year-old kid and being ripped out of his home, uh, his city that he loved and grew up in destroyed, probably most of his family is killed, and he's hauled off to another world, another culture, another language, nothing. This would be fairly significant to have the Jeremiah scroll and says, it's just for a time. 
I do have a plan for you. I've got a future for you. You've got to kind of hang on here. You're going to have to trust me. And he's done it. He's done it for 70 years. I don't think like this is the first time he's read this uh, prophecy from Jeremiah. I bet he read it a lot. I think he probably had it memorized. And, uh, and he's recalling and he's reading. Now, the thing about the other thing that would have impacted him is that uh, the Babylonian siege uh, of uh, Israel and Jerusalem in particular was in about 606 B.C. So uh, it's about 68 years or so. So Daniel's thinking, wow, time's almost up. And what's supposed to be happening? You will seek me when you find me and seek me with all your heart. And Daniel's thinking, I don't think anybody's doing that. I mean, as a nation uh, in captivity, God says, if you do this, then this is what's going to happen. And Daniel's getting concerned about the heart of the people and where they're at because he's what he's reading in the Word. Because what God is saying about them, their condition, and what's going to be happening, and what are they doing to get ready for what's going to, going to happen. And, uh, and he's, he's moved in the same way. I mean, we're studying prophecy. We're, we're looking at what's going to happen. We've been talking uh, in very uh, tremendous detail about the European Union, the rise of the Antichrist, the tribulation period, all these things. So what, that's what God says is going to happen. Are we being moved? What should we be doing in response to God's word? In the same way, Daniel was in a time when God was getting ready to fulfill, fulfill a promise, a prophecy and he's saying, man, one thing that needs to happen is not happening. We're not really seeking you with all of our heart. And you're going to see more of his concern for the people as he goes on and prays. But the bottom line is that as he studies God's word, he's prompted to prayer. And, uh, and I can just tell you, I, uh, as a young Christian, I, I was fortunate. I mentioned Danny Lehman <coughs> coming in a couple of weeks. And one of the things that... Um, uh, that just always blew my mind about about Danny is the amount of scripture that he's got uh, that he has memorized and he's one of these guys that uh, when he first got saved he had taken so much LSD that if you met him today he wouldn't know you tomorrow <laughs> he absolutely wouldn't even know you he was just a space case and uh, and we got saved and God uh, began to bring his mind back and bring his uh, memory back and so forth. And uh, one of the things I noticed is that when I, we would pray together, he was constantly, as he was praying, he was reciting scripture. Lord, you say in your word. And, and therefore, Lord, we ask this. And uh, that's the kind of prayers that Daniel is praying here. He's in the word and he knows the word and God is promising certain things. We know certain events are going to happen. So there's a certain expectation and he's praying for those, that expectation. Uh, Hey, for us, we know that in the end times, people are going to walk away from the faith. People are going to walk away from sound biblical teaching. People are got, these are all things that accompany this end time. So what should we be praying? That that wouldn't happen. That people would stay in the word and they'd keep their eyes on the Lord and so on and so forth. But God's word is, should be prompting us to, to pray. Secondly, Daniel's heart turned towards prayer in great resolve. Verse 3, so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and uh, in ashes. And, uh, and again, uh, the, it was just a priority for him. I read a recent survey that I hope they didn't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, they interviewed 20,000 Christians, 139 countries, ages 15 to 88. And, uh, and they found that... Four in ten Christians around the world say they are often or always rush from task to task. Six uh, to ten Christians say it, it is always or often true that the busyness of life gets in the way of developing a relationship with God. Really? <laughs> I think that's pretty, <laughs> a pretty common thing, just the busyness of life. I, I would think of, if we did a little interview with our, our, our uh, a little survey ourselves, I'd say a lot of us would say, yeah, we, we'd want to spend more time in prayer or whatever to develop in the word, to develop our growth of the Lord, but we're just, busyness, you know, keeps us. But again, Daniel resolved. He, uh, he was, uh, this is the guy that, that, uh, that uh, prayed three times a day. And when the, uh, the king issued a decree that says, anybody that prays to any other God than to me, uh, I'm going to throw in the lion's den. Well, I'm still going to do it. I mean, Daniel would rather be thrown into the lion's den than to miss a prayer meeting. I would say that was fairly committed, wouldn't you? Uh, and uh, this is a guy that from the very outset is, is a young guy, is a young teenager, 
uh, resolved in his heart that he would not defile himself. The Bible said this, and the uh, king said that, and it was contradictory. He's going to go with what the Bible says. If it cost him everything, it cost him everything. Uh, committed all, all the way. And we see that here in, in his prayer. Notice also he was resolved uh, in terms of uh, praying uh, not to defile himself and, uh, and being committed to prayer. It was just uh, uh, amazing. I, I read about a group in Washington, D.C., a group of young Christians that had uh, taken up the idea of intercessory prayer. And they, they determined that uh, each person in the group would pray uh, in shifts uh, six days a week for eight hours uh, a day, and then uh, two-hour shifts, six to ten of them would go directly to the steps of the Supreme Court, pray silently with red duct tape over their mouths and the word life scribbled across it, and of course they're praying for the end of abortion. They just thought this has got such a, a horrific thing that goes on. We can, we can change this if we pray. Let's get together. We'll divide up. We'll make sure somebody is praying Eight hours a day, six days a week, we'll make sure there's always at least four or five people, six or eight people on the steps of the Supreme Court praying silently. That, I'd say that's fairly committed to prayer. That's a pretty, that's a pretty high benchmark. Uh, that's a Daniel. These are young Daniels that are just like committed to prayer uh, no matter what. And what keeps us from doing these things is just uh, we're just busy. Life is busy. But uh, let me ask you this. Uh, how many of you, you've kind of missed several times in the last week brushing your teeth? Because you're busy. I mean, we're all busy, but you just, you know, you try to get it when you can, but you just, you do the best. No, you probably all did pretty well. How about eating? I don't know, that's a big priority with me. I mean, I got to do that a couple, three times a day. I can kind of miss one. I can't miss two in a row. I get kind of edgy, you know. Uh, in other words, we... We make room for things that, are, that we see as necessities uh, in, in our lives. And, uh, and for uh, this kind of prayer, we need to, we need to see it as, as a necessity. Prompted by the word, uh, Daniel has got a resolve to be in, in prayer. Notice his uh, attitude. Secondly, Daniel had a great resolve in his attitude towards prayer. This is a guy that's a prime minister of the country. Yet he's going around in, in like clothes that you do yard work in. I mean, the idea of sackcloth, you know, went, not the most comfortable, kind of the, you know, uh, his yard working clothes, we might say. Uh, ashes on his head uh, and kind of strange to us, but it just spoke of his humility. Uh, he wasn't going to stay all dressed up. He was going to, he changed what he wore. I'm not recommending ashes on your head. Uh, and uh, people might notice, though, that you're really in prayer, but... Uh, uh, it all just spoke of his humility. Uh, he's he's going to actually change what he wears, changes his appearance because he's going to humble himself before God. And then he he's willing to miss a few meals. He's even even fasting, uh, you know, as he prayers. Remember when Jesus said, "Now when you fast, don't be like the Pharisees." Oh, he didn't say if you. No, he said, "Now when you fast, don't be like." Oh, I guess Jesus expected that we'd be fasting and praying on a regular basis. Son of a gun, I missed that before. But here Daniel is a guy that is even willing, missing. he's pretty serious about prayer. Again, why is it that sometimes it seems like God isn't taking us very seriously in our prayer request? Why don't we see God, God moving more? One of the things that... Um, I'm always incredibly impressed with when I go to India with the guys from Gospel for Asia and watch not only what they go through and their willingness to be beaten and persecuted for getting the gospel out, and they all are, uh, and everything, and it's, it's amazing. And, uh, but um, one of the things that I, I'm always amazed at is their, their prayer life and their commitment to prayer. I remember one of the guys that um, we've become good friends with, Lalajan, and he was saying when he was a young guy, and uh, he was asking about us about marriage and marriage counseling. If we, as pastors, if we do marriage counseling and that kind of thing, we talked about that a little bit. And I was traveling with a couple other guys, pastors from Hawaii, and he says, "Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't have much training in that er that area." And I'll try not to go into my Indian accent here. He says that uh, I have to fight it though, because I. Uh, but he says I don't have much training in that area. So the first time he got a call, a uh, couple in the church that were having marriage problems. Uh, he just came over uh, and, uh, and said, uh, well, I don't really know what your problems are, but uh, I know it's always an issue of sin. 
So uh, you probably both need to confess your sin, repent from your sin. God will forgive. He'll heal your marriage. I'll be over here in the corner praying for that, <clears throat> which he did all day. And then he slept in that corner. And then the next morning, he prayed all day. He didn't leave the people's house for three days. He just stayed right there for three and a half days, fasting and praying until they both came in and went, we can't take it anymore. <laughs> Uh, and they just totally confessed their own selfishness and they weren't following God's word and they weren't just, you know, and they just broke and they just asked God to forgive them and, and healed them. And he said, oh, very good. And then he went and he said, so brothers, that's, that's how we do marriage counseling in India. How, how do you do it in America? <laughs> uh, we give them a book to read or a tape to listen to, you know, and Prayer. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's such a vital thing to so many Christians, but in our busyness, we can uh, not have the kind of resolve that Daniel had here. Verses 4 to 14, we see Daniel's heart uh, turn towards prayer because he chose to relate uh, to the people. Now remember, Daniel's a pretty righteous guy. Listen to what, what he prays here, verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke to, uh, in your name to our kings and princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes and our fathers, are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have, uh, because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Uh, Daniel chooses here, volitionally chooses to relate to the people in their sins. Notice that what we have done, we have done. Now, has Daniel done these things? Not personally, but as a people, as his people, as the people he cares about, as his nation, they've, they've done these things. It'd be very easy for Daniel to be kind of self-righteous at this point, don't you think? I mean, he's the guy that goes as a teenager and does it all right. He's 85, 86 years old. He's lived a really a tremendous life of integrity, been used by the Lord and so forth. But it would have been very easy to say, Lord, those guys, and you know what they did, you know, and I didn't take part in it, but to be, Lord, have mercy on them he doesn't, even, he doesn't even go there. So one of the things that really impresses me about the Apostle Paul, in, in the last, his last of the last words he writes at the end of 2 Timothy, he's, uh, he's pleading with Timothy, and that's the come before winter passage. He knows he's going to die. He's already had his first trial before uh, uh, in Rome, before Nero, where he's... Uh, uh, that would be the time where you could have character witnesses and present evidence that I haven't done what they said I've done or, and so forth. And, uh, and nobody came. Nobody showed up. All the elders of the church at Rome, everybody bailed. Because, I mean, after all, it looks like he's kind of headed, you know, to, for, uh, to be executed. And if you stand up with him and he's found guilty, maybe you're going to face the same things. Everybody bails on him. Now, a lot of the guys that we're familiar with, Titus, Timothy, <coughs> Luke, these guys, they're not with him at that point. They're, they're out serving other areas where he's directed them. It's, and he's telling Timothy to come, and he tells him, come before winter, because if he doesn't get there before winter, he's not going to get there. Paul knows the second time it's just, you're going to be executed. And if he doesn't get in a boat soon and get there, 
didn't exactly fax the letter to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Took a while to get there, and nobody sails during the winter. It just kind of all shuts down because of the weather. So he says, come before winter. But when you come, man, you got to forgive them, Timothy. I've forgiven them. They all abandoned me, but I've forgiven them. And when you come, you got to forgive them as well. Otherwise, the gospel is not going to continue in Rome. This church is going to die out. They need you. Here's a guy that said, my life, my thing is not as important as the gospel. And I won't, if anybody could have got self-righteous, it could have been Paul. I mean, he had risked his life for them, all the things he had done for the sake of the gospel, but he, he never goes there. And I think there's a danger uh, in our, in, for us because things are getting more wicked. I don't know if you noticed, but man, it's just every night on the news and different things I read, it's just, it's getting worse out there. It, it would be so easy to get in an attitude of us and a them. And, uh, and, you know, us four, no more, God watch over us. But man, you know, get those rascals, God, because uh, they're, they're doing horrific things out there. They're trying to kick us out of every avenue of uh, public expression in this country. And, uh, and sometimes you can listen to guys that express a conservative viewpoint. It's good to kind of get another, another picture of the news and, uh, and everything. Uh, at the same time, some of those guys, I mean, they're conservative, but they're not Christian. And they're very uh, mean-spirited. They're very sarcastic. And some of them, if you listen to long enough, you can, you can get a lot of anger going as you hear how bad it is. And we don't want to do that. Uh, we're to love our, our enemies and never get a kind of a self-righteous thing. Again, think of Daniel, who he was, and the kind of prayer that he just prayed. It's, it's pretty incredible. But he's not alone. This is like the typical prayer in the Old Testament. Listen to Nehemiah, who's a pretty, pretty uh, you know, uh, you know stand-up guy as well. Uh, Nehemiah prays this, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love and those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Uh, these guys just... They kind of jump right into the mire and say, we're all in this together. Application, we're not doing well as a nation. We're killing a million babies a week on top of everything else. I mean, if anybody was right for the judgment of God, it's us. But God has with, withheld his hand for a time. Uh, we need to pray, oh Lord, help us, our nation. We have done horrible things against you. We have in the public squares have turned against you. We as a nation, Lord, your word says, if your people are called by your name, will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, then you'll hear from heaven. That needs to be our, our prayer. That's, that's Daniel's prayer. And, uh, and I think it's, a, it's just, uh, again, these are great, great guidelines. Notice also Daniel chose to relate the people and they're turning away from God's word. Verse five, we've turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, uh, the prophets, turned away from Bible teaching, Bible preaching. Uh, and Daniel says, we've done that, Lord. And we could say that as well. That's, that's gone on uh, throughout our country. The Apostle Paul warned against it in 2 Timothy 4.3. He says, for a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Uh, that, that's the day that we live in as well. Again, why doesn't God answer our prayers sometimes? Why do they seem like they're bouncing off the, the ceiling? And, uh, and sometimes, again, it's just, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not responding to him that what we've learned uh, in the word. We're not, it's not just, uh, uh, man, uh, such a priority uh, in our lives. Pretty intense prayer that Daniel's praying here. Uh, third, Daniel chose to relate to the people in their faithlessness, and he contrasts that to God's faithfulness. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obeys his commands. But, uh, but he says, but we haven't, and we've turned the other way, and, uh, and, and so forth. And he also knows, uh, acknowledges God's justice. And uh, he says there in verse 11, therefore the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses the servant of God have been poured out on us because we've sinned against 
to you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us, against our rulers by praying in upon us great disaster. In other words, we're just, <laughs> we're eating it here, man. This is like not good. But you know what, God? You are just in what you do. We're getting everything we absolutely deserve. You know, nobody's, nobody's going, if you're a God of love, why could you allow this to happen to me? See, nobody's taking that line. I mean, Daniel isn't. Maybe some others are. Daniel isn't. Daniel's going, man, if it's not for the mercies of God, we'd be consumed. A little, again, this is kind of a reality check in our, in our prayers here. Daniel's heart was turned uh, because he was reading the word. He had a resolve uh, in prayer. He chose to relate to people in the verses 15 to 16. Daniel's heart is turned towards prayer because he's concerned for the reputation of God. This is another huge thing if you read prayers of uh, some of these great saints in the Old Testament. Uh, listen to verses 15 and 16. Now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and made uh, for himself, uh, excuse me, made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong, O Lord. In keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away uh, your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquity of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. Is, I mean, and this is just typical. What's, what's God, what does God care about? What would God have us to be praying for? What's on his heart? Man, if you can get there, you're going to see prayers answered. Now, and again, Daniel's not trying to backdoor God. He's not going, well, I want to some prayers answered here, so I'm going to kind of get some of my own needs in there. And if I kind of throw something in that I think is interesting to God, then he'll probably jump all over it, and maybe I'll get them all answered. He's not trying to psych out God here. Uh, he just realizes that, <laughs> as we said last week, God is large and in charge. He's got an agenda. There's things on his heart, and guess what? He's a lot smarter than we are. If we pray to get his will done, I got a feeling that I'm going to be along for a good ride in all this. If I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things that kind of consume me, material things and everything, they're going to come along as well. The issue is getting my eyes upon the Lord. And here, what's God concerned about? He says, man, it's, it's your city. It's your sanctuary. Uh, it's where on this city you said it would bear your name. Uh, man, this whole thing man, this has got to be bumming you out, God. I pray that you'd do something about it. I pray that you'd be famous. I pray that God, uh, people would look to you and look to me and they'd take delight in it. You'd get the glory. You'd get the credit. It's the prayer that Daniel is praying. And I want to suggest if we start praying like that, God will do something. And, and I do pray that, that prayer a lot. God does something in this church, he gets all the glory. Because we don't do anything except teach the Bible and show up and love each other and worship God. That's all we do. If God does something here, he gets it all. He gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. Nobody can stand up and say, well, I came up with a brilliant strategy for reaching people. And after I attended uh, various seminars and uh, studied uh, with the sociologists in the area, and I did some surveys on my own, and there's a lot of churches that do that. And then, and then in the end, they can do that. God bless them. Uh, but that's not the prayer of Daniel. The prayer of Daniel is, man, let's make God famous. I love, uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen him in a while. Stephen Anthony is the pastor of Hope Chapel Kailua. And for years, our offices were next to each other uh, upstairs. And he's kind of, he's a rock and roll guy and stuff. And he always, his, uh, one of his lines is, is uh, uh, he says, I'm, I'm going for God's Grammy. You know, I, I don't really care about the secular word, but I want a Grammy from God, you know, because I want to make God famous. You know, in what I do and the way I sing and, and carry myself. And that's a great, that's a great attitude. That's a, uh, we do that, God moves. God, and it's not a, well, let's think of something God wants and then we'll kind of psych him into <laughs> answering our prayers. No, it's just, that's where our hearts need to be. Lord, what's, what's con, what's, what are you concerned about? You know what? He is concerned about your families. He's really concerned about your, your, your marriage. He's really concerned about your kids uh, and how they live their lives. 
You don't have to invent the stuff. I mean, it's right there in the New Testament. What's God concerned about? He's really concerned about your being conformed into the, the image of Jesus. He's really concerned about you, whether you really, uh, you know, have God's love uh, in, in you or not. You know, we don't, we don't have to like, whoa, what's on God's mind, you know? Uh, he's, he's concerned really about the issues that ought to be concerning us as well. And when we go to him and say, Lord, I know you, you care about my family. Uh, and you want my family to be a picture of Christ in the church. And it isn't, Lord. But I know you care more than I do, Lord. So I pray for your will to be done in my family. I pray you'd get the glory because we'd be able to live it out, Lord. That Our family would be a, a light in a dark world. People would be attracted to you because they see what you do in, in our lives. That's a, that's a Daniel prayer. That's the kind of thing we're, that uh, we see here. He's concerned for the reputation of of God. It kind of, this doesn't mean, you know, give us <coughs> this, our daily bread. It's okay to get the daily bread bread in there. We have needs and everything, but I'm just saying that, that uh, our tendency can be uh, pray at last resort <laughs> and pray when I got bad. I got, I'm pressed here. I got a tremendous need. This thing ain't working and I need you to come through. Uh, and that's good. That's okay. The Lord's there. He hears those prayers. He's attentive to our prayers. But, but overriding all of this, there's got to be something kind of driving us down the road uh, a little more than, than those concerns. Uh, a concern for the reputation of God's city. And then uh, we mentioned that uh, he's concerned for God's reputation uh, in, in honor. Uh, just a couple of uh, 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 illustrations. As one is uh, David and Goliath. Why did David fight Goliath? Because that guy was blaspheming God, and he was ticked. David's this young teenage guy. It, you know, he's kind of kicked out. Parents don't care about him. Older brothers ridicule him, all that. Not the best home life. And uh, he's uh, basically out with the sheep because they just want to get rid of him. Could have been very bitter about that. But he just, hey, it's just me and the Lord. <laughs> hey, Lord, I think I'll worship you. Wow, those stars are great. You know, and he just writes the Psalms and sings out there by, by himself. This could have been a very bitter little kid, uh, but he wasn't. He just like relished in his time with, with the Lord. Uh, by the time he shows up and sees Goliath, it's like, man, he's right from the, fresh from the presence of God. Somebody's got to do about something about that guy. I don't care if he's nine foot tall or not. He's cursing God, you know, and it's like nobody's doing anything. All right, give me a couple of rocks. I'll take care of this guy. But it wasn't for himself. He was concerned for the glory of God. Listen to what um, uh, Moses writes in, uh, in Numbers 25. And this was uh, an episode with a guy named Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, because of some radical sexual sin that was going on with the, uh, the Israelites there, as part of their wilderness wandering. Verse 10 of Numbers 25, the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, for he was zealous as I am for my honor among them so that in my zeal I did not put an end to them. Therefore, tell him I am making a covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. God's a little concerned for his honor and his name, as we all are. None of us like to have a bad name, bad reputation. God doesn't either. And uh, apparently he's he kind of digs the idea when someone's willing to stand up for him and be concerned about his honor in, in his name. Again, uh, reading the word, the resolve to pray, relating to the people, concerned for the reputation of God. Five is in 18, uh, second half of uh, verse 18. Daniel's heart is turned towards prayer because he requests the mercy of God. He says, we do not make requests because, uh, of you because we are righteous, but because of your mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act uh, for your sake, O my God. Do not delay because your city and your people uh, bear your name. So he, again, he requests to be heard uh, based on the, the mercy of God. Uh, you know, sometimes we kind of get all this uh, mixed up here a little bit in terms of our approach we got to God because we, uh, we are uh, under grace and under a different covenant than these guys and so forth. Uh, but we don't come to God as the big dude in the sky or, or, some, or anything like that. You know, we've kind of got this uh, Americanized thing going. This one quote cracks me up. There's, there's one line in it. I got to read it to you. It's from a book named Mark uh, Galley called um, uh, Jesus Mean and Wild. 
I have no idea what the book is about, but the line cracked me up. He says, Christians traditionally, as they've shaped Jesus, have been worried about getting it wrong, including the Puritans. Americans today are not so worried. There isn't the sense that this is a life and death matter that you don't want to mess with divinity. There's a freedom and even a playfulness that Americans have. The flexibility our Jesus exhibits is unprecedented. There's a Gumby-like quality to Jesus in the United States. Even turning Jesus into a friend among born-again Christians, that kind of chutzpah is something unknown even to the Americans in the colonial period. The Gumby Jesus. I mean, in other words, you, know, you have the Gumby, you can kind of bend them and shape them and whatever. And a lot of, that's, uh, a lot of people think, um, there's Jesus, uh, he's my friend and so forth, give me what I want and I'll just bend and shape him for whatever my, my needs are. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't come to uh, God that way. Daniel says we come and we say, Lord, I pray that you'd be merciful. We don't deserve anything. And, and that's a good way to pray. You're praying for somebody to be healed. Lord, none of us deserve to be healed. We pray for your mercy, that out of your mercy and your care for us, that you love us, that you might heal this person now, that you would get the glory, Lord, not just relief of pain for us, not so life would be better for us, that you'd be glorified. That's, that's, the, that's a Daniel kind, kind of a prayer. At the same time, we do come to him in mercy, so it's not performance-based. I don't come because... I'm going to pray a mighty prayer because I had my devotions every day this week. I haven't missed church in over two months. In fact, I've memorized several scriptures in the last couple of months. And based on that, man, I can really pray now. No, it's not. It's mercy. It's just we get what we don't deserve. Uh, but because of that, again, we remember that what our approach uh, is to the Lord. Lamentations 3.22 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And again, because we focus so much on the grace of God, which is good, and we try to, that sometimes we forget everything it says about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And literally, it means it's the beginning of everything. Uh, Daniel comes and, man, he makes his request based on the mercy of God. And then he makes his request based on the things that concern God, as we've kind of mentioned already, the, the, the city, uh, the people, the things that are on uh, God's heart and so forth. That's what he's praying for. Six, da um, Daniel's heart is turned towards prayer and he receives a response, verse 20 to 23. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of uh, my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel... The man I'd seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. I like that, swift flight. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, uh, an answer was given, which I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. And then he does answer him. His concern is for Jerusalem, for the people, for the return for the Messiah, and the angels, and Gabriel says, "Why do you hear this?" <laughs> and, he, and that's what we'll look at uh, next time. But notice how quickly the response comes. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, this archangel that seems to be directly involved always with the affairs of uh, of Israel and, and the Jewish people, shows up. Now, in chapter ten, we get another little glimpse into Daniel's prayer life, and in that case. Gabriel's going to tell him, as soon as we, uh, God heard your prayer, sent me with the answer, I couldn't get through. I was battling to get through a, a being referred to as the prince of Persia and another being referred to as the prince of Greece. And there's some, we, we kind of get the curtains drawn back on the heavenlies, get to see a little bit of what we might call spiritual warfare taking place uh, in the heavenlies. But in this case, uh, the response is, uh, is quick and... Um, and however far God's presence is from us, it was a swift flight for, for Gabriel to get back with the answer. And then notice how, uh, how kind the response was. He refers to Daniel as being highly esteemed. You know what that means? It means greatly loved. Uh, here's a guy, you know, 85, 86 years old, faithfully served the Lord, you know, all, all of these years in really, really difficult circumstances in, in a culture that was absolutely anti-God and, and against him. And, 
and uh, in all the things that would come with or could have come with the baggage of being ripped out of your home and moved to another country and so forth. But here's a guy that had always uh, purposed in his heart not to defile himself, you know, obeyed God's word, even if it meant his life, even if it meant going to the lion's den. And uh, what a blessing is he's concerned over the things that concerned God. God, I'm concerned. Uh, we're supposed to be returning in a couple of years, but I don't see the people really seeking you with all their hearts, Lord. Uh, th- but that's what Jeremiah said was going to happen. Lord, I pray that your will would be done. I pray that people would be moved to prayer. They would seek you with all their hearts so your word would happen. It would come through. Our people would return very unselfish in his prayers. And God says, I can answer that real fast. And by the way, did I mention that I love you greatly? You know, and that's, that's God's answer uh, to us as well, especially when we can get to a place where our prayers, and, and, and please, I'm not saying don't pray for your needs and things that are going on, but, but the idea is that our prayers would take on a, a different motivation sometimes, a different dimension. We'd be praying and saying, what is, what's God concerned about? And when we meet with the guys on Saturday morning, I was trying to begin that and just pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and put on our hearts the things that are on God's hearts uh, so that we could pray those things, those things out. Because when we pray in God's will, he's going to answer those prayers. Uh, the, the prayer might, uh, the response might be coming and there might be a battle going on in the heavenlies and we don't see anything right away like in uh, uh, chapter 10. Uh, but God doesn't mean God's not moving. And um, I, again, I think sometimes if, uh, to use a, a metaphor, he's on the edge of his seat, as it were, waiting for us to pray for his will to be done in a particular situation because he's tied us He's, uh, 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 you know, with him. We're united with him to see his kingdom come and his will be done as we, as we pray. And, uh, and I, I love it that, uh, that the end comes here with uh, Daniel, this old, older man being told how highly esteemed he is uh, by the Lord. And uh, I pray that we would see that as well. The Bible says that uh, God demonstrated his love for us in this Yet while we're sinners, Christ died for our sins. Does God love us? Yes, he demonstrated his love for us. Even before we came to him, even when we're in absolute rebellion, that's when he died for us. He didn't say, if you'd get it together a little bit, then, you know, I'd be willing to die for your sins. Or if you kind of reach this level of perfection, then I'd be willing to sacrifice my life. No, he says, I want to demonstrate real love. And uh, we never have to doubt the love of God. Let's pray that God would, again, motivate our hearts. And, and what I would encourage you to do is, is uh, in your Bible, Daniel 9, the prayer of uh, Daniel, underline a couple of these things. And then this week, just open your Bibles and just read through. Lord, I'm not always so unselfish in my prayers. Help me. Read the Word and then, let, and then respond to God. Have a conversation. It's a personal relationship. And, uh, and see what God will do. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that uh, you desire to answer our prayers, but you're also very wise and a loving Heavenly Father. And, and uh, a lot of times the answer is no to some of our frivolous things and things that we really don't know what we're, we're asking for. We've all got prayers uh, that we've looked back and thought, man, I'm glad God said no to that, <laughs> Lord. So help us pray in wisdom. Help us pray uh, prayers that are, that are biblical, prayers that are, are concerning you, uh, in your will for our lives, for our families, for our church, for, uh, Lord, the, the people here on, on the windward side. There's a lot of things that are going on, Lord, uh, the, the drugs and, and the things in particular here on the windward side that are breaking your heart. And, um, and you're just desiring to people to come to you and, and, and pray for the things that, are, uh, that you care about, that you're concerned about, families. Lord, that are being uh, ravaged and so forth. You're, you're concerned about that, Lord. Lord, may we be never self-righteous, but always relating to the people around us and, and pray with them that our sins would be forgiven, that you would turn your wrath away, that we'd come to you in mercy, God, and that whatever you do, you'd get the glory for it. We'd be concerned about your name and your reputation. It, it, none of this comes to us naturally, Lord. It's a supernatural work of your spirit 
to birth this kind of praying in our hearts, Lord. And so that's what we're asking for now, and that's what we're praying for as we respond now to your word, even as Daniel did. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.